Good evening and welcome to this event on the twisty path of democracy in Brazil. I'm Lori Medina, director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Michigan State University. I wanna thank the organizers of this event, Christina Schmidt, MSU professor of linguistics, and Enrique de Castro, professor of economy and international relations at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to pass this off now to Christina, who's going to introduce tonight's speakers. Hi, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sofia Vizcarra, uh, who's going to be talking about fake news as a political phenomenon, consequences for the Brazilian democracy. Sofia is an assistant professor at the International Relations Program at University do Vale do Genocinos, Unicinos, Brazil, and is a researcher for the World Value Survey, the Brazil team. She holds a PhD in sociology and a master's in political science from Peru, and a master in international security and a BA in Ibero-American Ibra studies from uh, Science Po at on France. Her work focuses on political culture, international security, and security policies. Our second speaker is going to be Enrique Carlos de Castro, PhD in political science, an associate professor at Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, URGIS, and is the principal researcher of the World Value Survey and national director of, in Brazil. He was a researcher and guest professor at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies at the University of Notre Dame, Ecole des Hautes Etudes en, so en Sciences Sociales uh, in, Paris, in Paris, France, and at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. He works with research methodology, political culture, evidence-based public policies, artificial intelligence, and international relations. And we will have two commentators from MSU. So the first commentator is Rachel Modo, who's an assistant professor of the School of Journalism at Michigan State University. And she works on political journalism in the US and Brazil. And our second commentator is Luisa Araujo, who's a professor of economics at MSU and Fundação Getúlio Vargas. And his research is on theoretical applications of game theory to monetary economics. And we are all here in the go of kind of having bridging researchers who are in Brazil and researchers who are abroad. And we hope that this is the first one in a line of a series of conversations and perhaps potential collaborations. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Sofia is our speaker. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. And thank you for um, the kind invitation. And of course, uh, giving us the opportunity here from the World Value Survey team to discuss about uh, our research and about what we are doing here um, in Brazil. So uh, I'm Sofia and I'm going to talk tonight about uh, fake news as a political phenomenon, consequences for Brazil and democracy. So uh, we've been studying since uh, 2019 now. Um, and of course, since the election of 2018, uh, how, <clears throat> sorry, how fake news are affecting um, Brazilian democracy. Please, next. Thank you. So why we need to study fake news as a global phenomenon? Uh, so, of course, fake news is a global phenomenon. I think uh, you in the United States are really uh, also seeing the effects of the political effects of fake news, uh, what's happening. But um, of course, these political implications are similar in some sense, but they are also different because some of the consequences, mainly the mechanism about how fake news work, are related to some basic characteristic um, of local context. So we think that local context also matter in the moment of understanding how fake news work impacting um, 
on political phenomenon, specifically on democracy. So the idea is also to build middle-range theories to understand how they work. And this is kind of the focus of this presentation. Please, next. <laughs> So our research goal is to understand how fake news impact democracy in Brazil. And of course, here in the image are some of the, um, it's part of the answer. And the answer is related to trust, to trust institutions that we know is uh, a problem for all Latin America, uh, but also uh, interpersonal trust that is strong in uh, many Latin American countries. So how is trust embedded in the circuit is part of tonight's discussion. Next, please. So which are the methods that we are using uh, in this research? So we are, sorry, in the bigger uh, picture we are doing a comparative approach so this model that I'm going to present to you we are trying to uh, apply it to Latin American countries so not only Brazil but uh, Peru and other countries in the region that are having elections nevertheless the focus of tonight's presentation is the model in Brazil and how Brazil uh, serves as a case for proposing this model that we hope to present on comparative perspective later. So we are using mixed methods. We are using uh, quantitative data from the seventh wave of the World Valley Survey carried out in Brazil during 2018, before the elections. Uh, and we are also using qualitative data uh, that was collected in 2018 from 16 focus group carried out in five Brazilian capital cities. Next, please. Next. Okay. Hi, thanks. So the discussion tonight is uh, departing from a point that is to define fake news also as a political phenomenon. And in that sense, I'm not saying that fake news is not a communication phenomenon or an interdisciplinary phenomenon. Um, of course it is actually uh, we think that we need a broader perspective but the idea is also to uh, ask us how political science is specifically contributing to the studies of fake news so in this approach we understand that fake news are um, a political phenomenon in the sense that is situated in a historical perspective so it's a phenomenon that is situated in time and space does this mean that Fake news is something new. We say, no, of course, there has always been false information circulating um, in different contexts, but the connectivity context and the kind of messages that are circulating now are also related to the political, social, and economic context that we are living today. And it's adapted to the situation. Also, we uh, propose that the causes of emergencies, so uh, part of why did it are catching now in a such in a such extensive way, is related to the characteristics of political culture and public opinion. And also, we're kind of focusing not only on why is fake news uh, a thing, why it's so popular, but also which are the political impacts of fake news for Brazilian democracy in this case, or actually for political regimes all over Latin America. So for understanding fake news as a political phenomenon, we need to understand it as a whole. We need to understand how it rises from society, but also how it comes back to society and the political arena. Next, please. Uh, so we are trying to discuss three main theoretical elements and um of course i'm not going to enter into detail about this but we're uh working with three main theoretical frameworks political culture public opinion and the culture of connectivity so we uh in the next model that i'm going to present these three theoretical uh strain are um, the theories that allow us to build the following model Next, please. I think it's 
okay, it's really, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little, but what's the idea? Is that um, there is a specific social context in the 21st century that is what Van Dyck calls the connectivity culture. So it's the idea that face-to-face -face and virtual social relations are embedded in a process of, of socialization. Even if each one has its own dynamics, we say that the political arena is both face-to-face -face and virtual. And during the pandemic, this has all only become increasingly important. And the virtual arena is more and more, like now, uh, our arena of socialization. And in that sense, uh, it is in the virtual arena that this phenomenon of fake news, this political phenomenon of fake news, is growing. Uh, and we say that what we see is that they correspond to the political culture of the society that they are trying to impact. So the political culture of uh, a place like Brazil is a breeding stock for the emergence of the phenomenon of fake news, but also the fake news reinforces the characteristic of political culture that puts at risk democracy. So because we in uh, Brazil have a hybrid uh, political culture, uh, and we're going to see that in a little bit, uh, this hybrid political culture already did uh, not put much emphasis on uh, the importance of democracy. And fake news is only um, weakening the support for democracy that Brazilians have. So by creating different narratives and by influencing political opinion, but also political behavior, um, fake news are eroding trust in political institutions, but also building uh, different narratives that are uh, feeding the contrast, contrasting imaginaries about democracy in the country. Next, please. So the key elements of uh, this perspective of fake news as a political phenomenon, and maybe this relationship with fake news, is that fake news are uh, departing from this hybrid connected political culture that is built by mistrust, by contradictory conceptions about democracy, by traditional values and existential insecurity, and by changing relationship with information. Next, please. First, we need to understand that fake news are based and they have as uh, grounds mistrust, mistrust in public institution. And that's why in uh, political terms, uh, fake news are trying to attack the trust in the institutions that we have. They create false information in institutions, understand as a broad uh, term. So we are talking about political figures, we are talking about representation, institution, we are talking about, I'm sorry, it's not so big, but uh, we see that the main public institutions in Brazil, like uh, the parliament, uh, the congress, and um, the judiciary have very low levels of trust in, uh, I'm sorry, Brett. Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot the word. Uh, in black, I'm sorry, uh, here in black are the levels of mistrust. It's people that do not trust at all uh, these institutions. And we are talking about the federal government, it's almost uh, more than 67%. So, what does this mean? That in Brazil we have mistrust, a general mistrust in institutions, but a general trust in democracy. And that we can see in the next slide, please. Um, so for Brazilians, for 68.4% of Brazilians, democracy is very important or absolutely important. And, uh, but they are not very satisfied with the political system. So, this situation of insatisfaction with the political system, but a general trust with democracy, make us think that, okay, so Brazilians are trusting democracy, but what are they thinking about democracy? And what is fake news trying to attack in this idea of democracy that Brazilians have? Uh, and by asking, 
Brazilians about their conception of democracy, we saw that they mainly emphasize individual conception of democracy in this regard of the collective. So when we talk about democracy with Brazilians, almost never both in the quantitative answer and the qualitative answer, the idea of society comes to mind. So we are not thinking about others, we're thinking about us and we are thinking about family. So we are always thinking about um, a very restricted conception of society. And this is where fake news are working on. They are attacking this uh, closed circle and they are building on threats to this closed circle, to this uh, basis of society that is reinforced by traditional values that um, Brazilian share. So Brazilian, they think that, uh, for example, a government without uh, the 30% uh, of Brazilians think that if the president didn't have to answer to, um, sorry, to the Congress, that would be okay. Or they think that democracy is that when the institutions fail, then the army takes the stand. And that are conceptions that they associate with democracy. Uh, so we see that this is very uh, a confusion in the concept. But this is reinforced by these ideas uh, of fake news. Next, please. On the other hand, we need to understand the context of connectivity that allowed this rapid spread, this algorithmical uh, spread of fake news, that this, uh, the use of new information um, media. So of course we see that the level of trust in political institutions is very low, the level of trust in communication media is intermediary, and the level of trust in your family is very high. But we see that in terms of the other graphic, graph two, that Brazilian and more and more using digital information rather than traditional media like TV, radio, or uh, journals to get information. Next, please. Uh, actually, we see that there is a significant difference when we uh, analyze how people get information by vote intention. So this is a vote intention when Lula is still in the race for presidency because the questions were asked in 2018 before his exclusion. But we see that the voters for Bolsonaro ha have a very high uh, percentage of uh, getting information by new media. So this was a group that already was very connected that had a very high level of uh, socialization and information by new media compared to other candidates to other candidates during 2019 election next please and actually we see that compared to other countries for example like peru Brazil is a country that is getting more and more information through this new media. So, uh, telephone, through internet, through, um, through social networks, uh, the levels are growing and growing regarding um, other years. And this is important because these are the media that are now spreading fake news. But it's also important for another time is the size of the market. So Brazil was an important market for trying to develop this mechanism adapted to la the Latin American context. So of course, this mechanism had already been proven in uh, the United States or in um, with Brexit in the United Kingdom. But the characteristics of the Brazilian market, the importance of the market allow to uh, try out in 2018 uh, narratives, uh, production of content, and try it in big scale. And we are, what we are seeing now, that we are seeing comparative uh, processes, is that it's uh, a model that is working in other countries. So Brazil is actually exporting the model of doing fake news for other uh, countries. And it's, not, uh, it's very important in that sense. Next, please. 
So we saw that in Brazilian elections, but I think I'm getting without time. But the idea here was uh, to talk a little bit about the narrative. Uh, so we actually uh, did two studies, one with the contents of the fake news for Brazilian elections, the Brazilian campaign, and the other with contents for COVID-19, but maybe we can discuss it a little bit later. But what we see is that the contents of this fake news correspond to these traditional values that we have identified both with quantitative and qualitative data. So we see uh, a correspondence of uh, these campaigns that were saying that, for example, the party of the workers was going to legalize uh, pedophilia, pedophilia, sorry, or uh, pedophilia, or that were going to homosexualize uh, children. So this was actually something that people uh, were willing to repass, even if they thought it wasn't true because it was more important to defend the values than to defend the idea of truth. Next, please. So uh, just as a conclusion, and I saw that I extend myself, uh, but the idea is that fake news as a political phenomenon has a narrower sense than a communication phenomenon. We understand that as a communication phenomenon, uh, we need to see also cognitive aspects, linguistic aspects, and a series of aspects that make us uh, understand fake news as a whole. But as a political phenomenon, we need to understand it in the context of uh, the political culture and in the context of political institution. And this is what allows us to understand the mechanism about how fake news work. So in that sense, fake news must be understood as a symptom and not as a cause of the current political crisis. Thank you very much. I'm now uh, give, give the floor to Henrique that is going to talk a little bit also about democracy in Brazil. So I hope he will cheer us up. Thank you, Sophia. And well, first of all, I'd like to thanks to the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the Michigan State University for organizing this event. And particularly to Christina, Rachel, Laurie, uh, Luis, and Royal. And again, it's a pleasure to be here together with, with Sophia, who is a very important member of our research group. Uh, Royal, could you please put the uh, presentation? Thank you. And next one, please. Oops. Henrique, that's, 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 that's not mine. That's not mine. That is uh, Luis. OK. He seems to be there. In a way, this is a Brazilian event. So something must go wrong. <laughs> okay, thank you, Raul. And uh, next one, please. Okay, um, I'm going to talk today about democracy as an ideology in Latin America and hegemonic values of the right wing in Brazil today. And of course, in order to support my vision that democracy doesn't work in Brazil. Next, please. Uh, after the uh, World War II, exporting democracy became a U.S. reason of the state, meaning that all efforts of the U.S. administrations, uh, from military power to the cultural industry, were part of it. But democracy had a very particular meaning at that moment. As you know, during the Cold War, the fight for democracy was the same as fighting against communism. And communism should, should be understood as any society of our politician that was not politically aligned with the U US or the Eastern European countries. In other words, 
the exportation of democracy was a way of saying defense of capitalism and anti-communism. In this, the US administrations would rather prefer friendly capitalist dictatorships than any democratic anti-capitalist societies. Even being far from communism, important is to be allied. Next one, please. Well, during the long history of the US-Latin American relations, the US saw the subcontinent as its backy backyard uh, and used different theories in order to justify the intervention in different countries, uh, such as the domino or the rape fruit theories, uh, and also supported and even contributed to the implementation of dictatorships and so on. It's important to point that Latin America was colonized in a very particular way. The state was implemented here in Latin America before the existence of a real civil society in Latin America. In very many ways, this state precedes the society. And different from the US, the sort of colonization in most Latin American countries implied a huge centralization of most decisions and initiatives uh, at the state sphere and contributed to the local authoritarian political culture. In the case of Brazil, we had the particularity that our colonization was not organized to better fit eventual migrants, but to better allow the explo exploitation sorry, of local uh, resources. One example uh, are the Capitanias Hereditarias, geographic land division that the Portuguese implemented before in Asia. Or even universities. Uh, if the universities in the Spanish speaker Latin America were founded in the very beginning of the colonization, in the 17th uh, century, for instance, the first Brazilian university was created just in the 20th century. Next one, please. Well, it's not a novelty to affirm that democracy among us is not the rule, but the exception. We have uh, this contradiction in terms called authoritarian liberalism which means that we are authoritarian in almost everything, but liberal in economy. Well, I don't mean a real liberalism, but a liberal discourse. Also, inequality at all levels is a terrible reality in all region, but especially in Brazil, one uh, of the most uh, unequal countries in the world. And the democracy, in general, democracy or something similar to it, let's say uh, like that, can be found only when it's convenient to, to the economic and political elites. Indeed, the only rule that exists uh, in the region is to guarantee the privileges of the elites at any cost. Next, please. The elites in Latin America always prefer top-down solutions instead of any types of participatory or bottom-up ones. And especially in Brazil, again, the elites and even most of all society believe that any other country is better than ours. And you can see a sort of political and cultural mimicry. Well, it doesn't matter if the uh, foreign examples do not fit our reality or even worse are even worse than ours. They are better by definitions. The elites, the elites have little or no uh, respect for loss. The loss is for the are for the others. And who is acquainted to the Brazilian culture is familiar with this very known saying. Do you know who are you talking to? which means that 
the other person must suppose that you are an authority. And because of this authoritarian relation, uh, the other one should be quiet. And what about the people? Well, the people are always seen, seen sorry, as a cannon fodder and pay the price of his lack of political power. This is the same as a real disdain for the people. And a singularity, singularity of Brazilian history is we had no liberators as other Latin American countries. The King of Portugal, when he turned uh, to Europe from Brazil, told his son, Pedro, take this country for yourself before an adventurer gets his hands on it. So Brazil was a gift from father to son. Next one, please. Um, as I think you cannot see but in this table, but I promise you, is there. Since 1930, Brazil has had 20 presidents, but just four of them were elected and ended their, their uh, mandates. Uh, and, by the way, the, there were several attempts to overthrow those other four presidents and even the current one. Uh, I can say that we seem to enjoy coup d'etat. Next. Thank you. Um, only know that Mr. Bolsonaro rules the country with a radical right-wing ideological administration, not only political one. But it's sort of ironic to realize that he and his main supporters practice a, a cultural struggle against any liberal or civiliz civilizational uh, values, which is a Gramsci-like way to do politics. As probably you know, Gramsci was an important Italian communist and Marxist thinker. And it's important to mention that the 1964 coup d'etat never ended since dictators, torturers, and main supporters of the civil military dictatorship were never judged as it occurred in other Latin American countries. In short, it was a political and ideological victory of the 1964 regime. Well, I will show now some data from the World Value Survey in Brazil. It's not quite different from the data uh, Sofia showed us, but okay, it's the same the data set. But uh, yes, as Sofia said, the data were collected when the former president Lula da Silva could theoretically be a candidate for the presidency. Next, please. Well, questions. The states make sure that people's income is equal. What, by the way, is not part of the classical democratic theory. In a mean from one to 10, uh, 5.2 or 26% agreed a lot equals to them with the statement. Uh, if she or he is satisfied with the political system, the mean is 2.5, and 60% said is very dissatisfied. If Brazil is governed uh, democratically, the mean 3.7, and almost 40% said that Brazil is not democratic at all. The armed forces take over with incompetent administration, mean five, and 25% agreed uh, very much. But believe me, th this data can be even worse. Uh, next one, please. If he or she would support a leader not concerned with parliamentarians or elections. 66% consider it 
optimal or good. Technicians governing instead of politicians, 82% optimal or good. Having a military rule, 46% said it was optimal or good. And if we split among the Lula's and Bolsonaro supporters, we will realize that 75% of the Bolsonaro's ones said uh, they would support a military rule. But Lula supporters were 45, 46%, which is not a very good news. And if Brazil should be ruled by religion laws without uh, parties of election, which is a new question uh, on the World Value Survey. 31% said optimal or good, which I believe is particularly dangerous to the country's future. Uh, next one, please. Well, as conclusions, um, given our history and political culture, the rise of a right-wing politicians is not a surprise. As a matter of fact, I wrote it in nine, back in 1995. Uh, unfortunately, I was right. On the one hand, our history and cultural roots are highly authoritarian and far from any democratic value. On the other one, our political culture supports and is a breeding stock for right-wing and anti-democratic values and governance, as we can see nowadays. But someone can ask, and what about institutions, parties, parliament, elections? Well, as um, you used to say in Brazil, they exist for the English to see. There is. They seem to work, but nobody trusts or believes in, it, uh, in them. Finally, unfortunately, democracy among us is not the rule, but the exception. And that's why I understand that democracy does, doesn't work in Brazil. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now uh, Rachel can make its comments. Yes, that's me. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm muted. Well, thank you. Uh, I will be commenting um, on uh, Dr. Sofia Vizcarra's uh, presentation, but generally with some thoughts I had as I um, as I've uh, heard both of your insights, and I thank you uh, for presenting them um, for us at Michigan State today. Um, I see these presentations as as a Brazilian um, in a very bad moment. Uh, Brazil is entering its worst uh, pandemic moment. 30% uh, of global new infections of COVID came from Brazil in the last 24 hours. So it is very hard uh, to be optimistic uh, as we see science denialism continuing to be the country's official policy. And uh, it seems like polarization has led half Brazilians to feel like um, things will pass mir by miracle. If we just jump on this new medicine, things will pass. And the other half uh, paralyzed by pessimism and a sense that nothing is getting done. So as we try to envision uh, a post-pandemic world and its challenges, I wonder how Brazilians can start building trust and rebuilding trust and be making truly informed uh, political participation uh, to have a truly informed uh, public sphere and uh, uh, an electoral process. It seems like right now we don't have many reasons to be optimistic, but I am personally optimistic that democracy is possible in Brazil. Um, the country has one of the most inclusive, efficient and independent electoral processes. You don't have to go beyond what happened in the United States to recognize that. Um, but we also have a vibrant media system, a vibrant independent media system that uh, still has uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, most people in Brazil still get their news from uh, professional journalists. But we also have, as both of you presented, an informational crisis that puts this informed citizenship in danger as well as institutionalized corruption and other 
um, dysfunctions that erode our uh, systems of accountability. So I thank you for sharing your insights with the class community uh, today, uh, which both provide great places to start. Um, so more than comments, well, I have uh, for you today are questions as how as to how can we think about solutions to some of the issues you've raised and how can your findings help inform some of uh, the solutions. Um, specifically, I'm intrigued by uh, Dr. Vizcarra's findings on the role of interpersonal relationships in the dissemination of misinformation. Uh, I have studied a lot of fake news and I haven't seen a lot of work that uh, addresses that. Uh, you see a lot of studies on the role of social media platforms. So what types of policies can they enable and should uh, or should they not do that? Uh, we see a lot of interventions at the individual level. Can we teach people how to fact check information when they get it? But we don't talk a lot about this meso level, like your trusted friends and family who are sending that information and how can how can we really challenge our parents when they are the ones sending that information? That's a really important component, um, not only in Brazil, but maybe in many other countries that share uh, a, a, a traditional, uh, more traditional values than what we have been studied uh, in um, in the U.S., which is very as as a reflection also of academic cultures. It's very individual level. Um, family dynamics might not only make people more susceptible of uh, misinformation, but susceptible to misinformation, but also might be uh, making people less willing to correct or challenge it. Uh, if you are like me, you might be in a family group right now where you have medical doctors who do not speak up when their uncles and aunts share a new story about uh, some medicine that has no nothing that does nothing against COVID. So how can we create interventions that address this important phenomenon that you've identified, considering culture, family dynamics, traditional values, etc. Um, another thing that um, that I thought was really important from your presentation was what types of uh, other less than ideal information exists out there. Uh, and I mean here, not just blatant false information, but also content that is distorted, sensationalized, inflammatory, uh, full of harassment, tapping into hate, tapping into identity. So perhaps as scholars and, and as we attempt to influence policymaking, we shouldn't be so like laser focused on teaching people what's true and what's not true, but instead focus on some of the other characteristics that form this fake news genre that it's not just misinformation, but it's a cultural phenomenon that has many elements that have consequences on how we trust each other and how we can make good electoral decisions or good political participation decisions. So how, thinking about you know, how can we create structures to rebuild trust within our networks, but also allow people to be able to challenge some of this uh, less than ideal content or inflammatory content. We, sh we should talk more about what you found. We should talk more about harassment. We should talk more about hate. Uh, we should talk more about uh, identity-driven content. If we were giving this the same attention that we're giving fact-checking, we might have, uh, th this problem might not have found uh, such uh, fertile ground in Brazil, for example. Um, my final question, actually two questions. Uh, another one, it relates to the role the mainstream media might play, uh, especially now the reporters in Brazil are in this interesting space in which they are being attacked, not for supporting the military dictatorship, which has been the traditional uh, ways that people talk about global or folia, as you, you support a conservative governments, but the opposite, they're being called communists and supporting like left-leaning left government. So for journalists, they're in this uh, interesting space in which both sides are attacking them. So now that no one trusts you, what, what role do you play in helping ensure a healthy informational ecosystem? And uh, my final question would be, how might the pandemic exacerbate or help diminish the influence of fake news in these decisions? Uh, I wonder, 
what do you think if like in the one hand it has of course exposed more people as everyone is on the social networks but as much of our in-person connections have became have become virtual but on the other hand it might have exposed to pe people to so much misinformation and seeing how this medicine does not work you know seeing those evidence that maybe this this whatsapp group is not giving me good information might have impacted some of the dynamics as opposed to 2018 when we didn't it, it was we didn't have that visible enemy that the pandemic uh, has become uh, in across the globe but especially in brazil uh that's uh, all i had for you today i look forward to this conversation i again uh, thank you for sharing your findings with us uh, they are really informative uh and i think they point to many different points they they indicate many different points of entry as we consider how might we help or what can be done uh in this very delicate moment in the history of my country uh luis uh, i pass uh the microphone to you luis please turn your microphone on Yes, sorry about that. Hello, can you please show the, the slides I have that I sent to you? I'm just a couple of slides. Huh? I mean, it was just my way of trying to see if I understood the main elements of uh, Enrique's uh, discussion, which I appreciate that one. And can you go to the next slide for me, please, Well, You see, I, I'm an economist, so I don't have much of the fundamental information should have to make a substantive comments on Henrique's presentation. But one thing I can try to do is see if I, could, I can organize a bit uh, his exposition in a way that uh, helps me and may also help someone that, uh, to, to kind of get a main, main sense of what's the main message there. No? So one thing we like to do in economics is we have this uh, different groups of concepts that we like to, to use. So we have this idea of fundamentals, which are like uh, things that we take as given, reference, technology. In our case, more like production function, things like that. But it could be rules, rules of a game. If you're doing a like game theory, it'd be like rules of a game. What what can you do, what you cannot do? What are, you, what are the actions available to you? They constrain the set of choices you can make. Then we have beliefs, which are kind of, these impressions that we may have about how, how people are going to behave. And one important thing about beliefs is the idea of coordination. How do we get to coordinate beliefs in a particular an outcome? Because this is what creates what we call equilibrium, situations in which we have like self-fulfilling beliefs. Like in economics could be like, uh, sometimes you have these financial bubbles and things are just expensive because everyone believes they're going to be expensive, so they act on that and they turn out expensive in the end, like self-fulfilling. So I'm going to just see if I can use that to understand and organize a bit my, my, my take of Enrique's presentation and elements I think are interesting there. So can you please go to the next slide for me, Kyle? So in terms of fundamentals, you see, what I got from Enrique's presentation is that in principle, when you do like, a game theory, for example, we have like very clear rules, what you can do, what you cannot do, what are your possible choices. You get to choose, but then you have a constraint set. And I guess like if you apply that to political science, it would be like the law, constitution, things like this. They're going to constrain the set of choices you have. And, I, and one thing that Enrique said that I think is quite interesting is that in Brazil, only the only rules to guarantee the privileges of the elite. And then I kind of I share, I mean, it's an interesting view. And, and one implication is that it doesn't, doesn't constrain much the kind of actions you can take. You can do whatever, as long as it's more like, instead of defining rules as, as forms of behavior, they're more looking like the end point. Then you can do whatever you need to get there. Just to give an example, something that I have been reading more recently, there is this debate about the rise and fall of the Lava Jato, this big, fight against corruption in Brazil. And I think it's a good example of a situation which you have the ends kind of dominating the means. 
So you can go against the law, you can go against the, 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 the state if the, if the objective is to fight corruption, which I think is kind of a bad way of thinking about rules. You see, they don't constrain much your choice. As long as you think you're right and you're going for a noble cause, you can do whatever you, you, you think is necessary to get there. And I think in Brazil, you have a lot of that, which is, which is not great. And, uh, and, uh, and that's one, my, one interpretation I have of this idea that rules in Brazil, they, they kind of tend, tend, tend to go in favor of the elites. Can you go for the next one, Ryo, please? So see, the, the first thing was like these rules, the fundamentals, then beliefs. So beliefs, I mean, it's complicated to explain where beliefs come from. They're just perceptions. No? So it's not that we have much to say about that. In economics, actually, we, we, it's, some, it's kind of a missing link there. But one thing I understand for Henrique's view is that, in his opinion, beliefs in Brazil, they're kind of, instead of being rooted in institutions, they're more rooted like in this historical background, these cultural roots that we have that pretty much like through some past dependence kind of thing led us to, to the beliefs we have today, which are, which are not great, kind of extreme beliefs. And I guess social media doesn't help that to make it less extreme at all, kind of. As far as I can see from the social media, the way it works, it kind of tends to kind of polarize things even more. Even the algorithms they have, they're just kind of favor this kind of polarization. So I get you, you and that goes into this coordination thing. So you have beliefs, it's a hard thing to think about coordination will be of beliefs. Then you have social medias that help kind of bring a bunch of extreme beliefs and they help coordinate those beliefs. And that can go parallel to whatever institutions we have out there. And they can kind of have a kind of pretty big impact, huh? not a good one. And then and the last one, please. Well, and then the last thing we have is the idea of equilibrium. And so I said equilibrium is this idea of self-fulfilling beliefs. You have these beliefs, you coordinate on them, and then you create some equilibrium. One thing we have in economics is that uh, sometimes you can have multiple equilibria, situations in which for the same set of fundamentals, you get different coordinations out there. So one question I have, maybe the main question I have for, for Enrique, maybe Sofia too, is like... Uh, should we think of the situation we have in Brazil, if you're going to frame that in the way I did, as like of a multiple equilibrium situation, which somehow we got to this bad coordination, but we still have fundamentals that would maybe allow us to coordinate in a good direction, or we are doomed to live in the kind of equilibrium we have because it's rooted in this history and there's no way we can go back and rewrite history. So we are just doomed to, to live like in this situation and we cannot uh, move beyond that. I hope, I, mean, I hope we can, but the thing is, from the, from the frame that Enrique uh, proposed, I don't think we have much choice there, because it's rooted in the past, and we cannot rewrite the past. So my point is, is there another way to try to move away from this bad equilibrium we have and try to coordinate on something a bit better? Because I agree with, I think we all agree here that Things in Brazil are terrible right now. <laughs> Much better if you could move on to, to a better scenario. Huh? And uh, yeah, I mean, that's maybe that's the main question I have. I mean, I understood your point, Henrique, that what we have is a bit of a kind of a past dependent thing, and there's the history there that's bringing us to this place. And, uh, but I mean, is there any way around that? <laughs> That's my question. And thanks a lot for the opportunity and for your presentations. I really enjoyed that. Uh, Sophia or Enrique, would you like to um, take a couple minutes to respond to the thoughts that uh, Rachel and Luis shared? Sophia, you first. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, your comments, and of course, for the event uh, as a whole. And also, thank you, Ryle, for helping me with the presentation. So, thank you. You back in backstage, um, but Rachel, yeah, actually, uh, uh, 
this is the points you took and that you highlighted are one of the things that um, they are somewhat ignored when we discuss uh, with many, for example, journalists of people from, that come from communication that are very focused on the individual and on education and fact checking. And I actually been called already like a fool because I was saying, no, it's important, you know, to, to understand the conditions of dialogue within the context of interpersonal trust. And I was like, no, that's not important. It's important, you know, to uh, set a scheme of incentives to understand what's right and, for, and what is wrong. But when we talked with the people uh, from, for example, the Fox group, it says, it's no longer a question about if it's true. It's just, do I agree with it? And if I agree with it, and if um, it seems important for me in order to me to take action, that is to share this news, is because I'm caring for the other. I'm not trying to convince you of, uh, of something. I'm trying to give you important information that I know you need, that uh, it's because I trust you that I'm sharing you uh, this information. And this is actually has caused a lot of internal conflicts in families. We saw like a physical conflict within families, um, but also family is still one of the places of dialogue. And this is, uh, because we need to understand that fake news as, as a political phenomenon build a political narrative, a simple political narrative that is being transmitted to people you think or could agree with it or could need it because it is important for them. So that is why it uh, spreads in closed circles. Uh, but on the other hand, we are not uh, fighting it with political work. We are not doing political work for fighting fake news. We are doing uh, informational work that is, of course, important. But fake news is like the pandemic. It's better to have many vaccines than to have one. It, it doesn't have sense to put all your money in one solution. So the idea of rebuilding dialogue space, rebuilding trust space, and trying to think how we can do politics different and thinking about politics as a social relation, a social relation that still have some levels of interpersonal trust. So maybe the challenge is to reimagine politics and, and it's like big words, of course, but uh, reimagine, for example, in what is the political nature of your relationship within your family and how this fake news has become a, rela a political relationship within your families could be a starting point of like trying to figure out what to do. So I think there is, there is a space. So of course, I'm not so pessimistic even if the data doesn't help, but uh, I think, um, it takes uh, a little bit, as Hiki once said, it takes a little bit of utopia sometimes. And it's very difficult in this context We are, uh, I think we're going to a lockdown soon or something like that. I mean, the, the situation here in, in Rio Grande Sul is very critical. So it's very uh, difficult to think of something very different in this context. Nevertheless, maybe is that kind of critical rupture that we need in order to emerge uh, from this crisis. And I think it's very important for Brazil to act on it because it's spreading in Latin America. And I'm, I'm Peruvian, so I'm watching Peruvian elections. And this narrative of fake news is now in media, in traditional media in Peru. So it's not something that is staying in the bubble. It's not something that's staying in social networks. So for uh, institutions for communication institutions they also could be both way they could go and do the fight or they could also make money by adhering to this narrative so it's for me it's not clear but of course i don't i do not study uh communicational institutions but from our perspective is both were possible because both both way are going to have an audience that is inclined to trust 
uh, this kind of narrative. I think I'm gonna stay there, but thank you for your contributions and it really helped us to continue um, the research. Well, I will be very fast because uh, I think we are out of time. But firstly, thank you so much, uh, Raquel and Luis, for your comments. And I'd like to begin saying I am a very, very optimistic person. As a person, I think, I believe that you can have a better country. But as social scientist, I am not that optimist. Just the contrary, I am very pessimist because all the data are against us. Uh, Luis uh, 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 for sure asked us about uh, um, the institutions. Well, I used to say that's hard to, to believe the institutions in Brazil because most of our political, economic, and even social problems are caused by the institutions. For instance, uh, let's see the overthrow of the uh, former president Dilma Rousseff. The rule, the the, the rule, of, the the, the uh, arguments that were used in order to throw her from the uh, presidency were the same that were used to maintain, to keep in power uh, President, former President Temer and right now Bolsonaro. So the rules are used following the, you know, the uh, will of the elites, not for, a, you know, a rational way using the, this economic uh, um, language that I, believe me, I'd like, I'd love that the Brazil worked like that, but it's not true. We don't. Uh, Andres asked, uh, how do we know that uh, uh, new source to trust? Mm. In general, what happens in Brazil, what our research uh, uh, um, show us, that uh, people believe in the news that he believes in. Which means, if something uh, is you know uh, correlated related to a way the way I see the society it's okay it's true and it's not true the opposite it doesn't matter the source source the the uh, uh, innate beliefs that people have it's much more important than the reality itself and uh, uh, Raquel how to build democracy in Brazil this is not a question of one million dollars, but hundreds, even uh, uh, hundreds uh, uh, of million dollars, because that's the money that the elites use in order to keep the situation like that in Brazil. It's not just saying or believing, but acting. They do it, you, it including to. Um, uh, uh, take a president from the from the the post. So I, I'm not I can I can't be optimistic when I see the reality. But as a Brazilian, I try to change it using my you know the, the civil rights, the few civil rights we have. For instance, do you know that uh, the Brazilian administration, the Ministry of Education, has sent um. A uh, uh, letter, uh, you know, an order to the universities in order saying that the uh, uh, faculty could not talk about politics. Well, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to work uh, being a social uh, political scientist and not talking about politics. It's quite weird, but not only as a political science, but as a citizen. It's part of my life. What is the way that the Brazilian administration is doing? And is trying to empower the people who is against democracy. This is uh, a huge part of the uh, Bolsonaro's supporters are, are against, against democracy. So they uh, are 
being empowered in order to support even another dictatorship. Uh, thank you. Thanks. We've got a question um, about the role that format um, in social media might play in spreading fake news. Um, so the questioner says, it seems like WhatsApp is more popular in Brazil uh, than here, and it differs from more public fora like Facebook because the news is mostly forwarded in group chats. Um, so does that make a difference, whether it's a, a WhatsApp chat or, or Facebook? Uh, here in Brazil, actually, WhatsApp is very used. And I think it contributed to the initial form of the narrative and the spreading. So how it's settled and how it spreads so quick. Of course, it was by transmission uh, from one to another. But once the, the narrative and the, um, the mechanism is in place, then it can be used both with WhatsApp, both with Facebook. It works with TV also. So uh, it was uh, a differential, especially uh, in terms of the size of the market, of the Brazilian market, in the size of the uh, velocity that uh, was allowed because uh, the, the uh, sharing of multiple emissaries and, well, we have a lot of uh, denunciations about uh, it's called laranja, uh, so like sounds that were used to pay for people who did this job during the campaign. So and this was like uh, under the table money. Uh, so I think the uh, format is more related to the scale of the initial phenomenon in 2018, and I think. Uh, in the United States, for example, there are all other platforms that have also played that role. I don't remember now the name of the platform that was banned uh, by Amazon and by other uh, media, but it's in the sense that these are interpersonal trust uh, networks. So you are getting this message from uh, the guy from your bakery or, you know, your aunt. Uh, so the idea of that because it is closed, uh, you're getting the message. But now this content is also being shared by uh, Facebook or by um, other platforms, but still it has this interpersonal trust element. Uh, so I, sorry. I, I just like to add one thing. Um, yes, the platform is very important. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, situation that some of the most important supporters of President Bolsonaro, such as uh, his family, were banned from uh, WhatsApp. And they immediately, immediately migra migrate from WhatsApp to another similar uh, social media. And a lot of the followers went together with them because this direct uh, way to be in contact, to be in touch with the population, this sort of populist or even fascist uh, uh, way to communicate is key to maintain, to keep the spreading of fake news. We've, we've got another, uh... Uh, I don't know if it's as much a question as a lament um, that's asking, that's saying, I can't see what can be done in Brazil. Um, are there are there steps that you imagine could be taken to Im improve conditions and who might take those steps using what tools? May I say a little bit about this. Well, if you look at the well succeeded uh, democracies or political systems in the world, we, we realize that they were built based on the study of its societies. For instance, the uh, father founders of the American democracy imagined 
they figure out a way to organize uh, those society. And they were completely free to do that. They didn't follow any obligation or, or no sacred rule to do that. They just did. The same in England. For instance, in England, the uh, Chamber of, of the Lords, uh, uh, the members of the Chamber of the, of the Lords are not elected. They are appointed by the government. So, but it's a democracy. Why should we in Brazil follow the same way of the democracy, uh, the democracy in other countries? Why couldn't we do our way of doing democracy with the same freedom of, you know, the same liberty of thinking that the British or the uh, North American did in the past? So I think this is one step to be done. We have to, in a way, be free of imposed rules, but build some democratic, for sure, rules based on the way we understand the world. That is important. And that, is, that would be a way to begin to change it. Just a quick comment, but of course it's uh, one thing that we see is that uh, Brazilian, for example, has made great progress by um, making individual rights something important. So uh, liberties and rights are something that is important for Brazilians, but not society. So uh, thinking about the other uh, seems to be something that has been lost. Uh, but has been lost maybe because um, democracy has been thought uh, to Brazilians and not only thought, but is um, imagined as the institutions, something that is very far from me. And now the idea that democracy is having a direct impact in your daily life, that what we are seeing today, what we are living, the current situation uh, with the pandemic, is directly to the consequences of what we're talking in democracy. And of course, imagine our own rules is part of the debate as Enrique is uh, saying. So we need to have this freedom for imagination, but we also need to understand this daily life uh, dimension of democracy. So democracy is not something that is distant from us. It's not only something that here in Brazil is like, Brasilia, that far away, but that democracy starts here with your neighbor, with your, um, with this daily conduct. So trying to connect politics back to society might also help in the way that we perceive politics. That's a good point. There's another question that's uh, that kind of draws a comparison between Brazil and the U.S. Um, does free speech occupy the same standing in Brazilian public opinion as it does in the United States. Uh, so here, for example, a major obstacle to uh, efforts to reduce fake news is that, is that that would be called attacking free speech. Are there similar values about free speech itself in Brazil? I think uh, Rachel could say something about it. Don't you? Oh, I'm okay. I'm unmuted now. Um, yes, I think yes. People have been starting to. I'm seeing some. I'm observing some really interesting um, process now of people blaming the platforms themselves for censoring uh, conservative speech in Brazil which you then see what Enrique was mentioning is that a person is uh, blocked from Facebook temporarily, right? So right now, if you share something about hydroxychloroquine, Facebook might block your account for 48 hours. And then that person goes on Instagram, which is a Facebook company or WhatsApp and writes along how Facebook is censoring free speech. I think a lot of the conversations about or I would say the co-optation of the term fake news by conservative by the conservative movement in Brazil 
has borrowed a lot from American discourse. So a lot of the arguments that were are used in the United States are imported and repackaged as Brazilian arguments. Um, so when the president here said the mainstream media is fake news, then you see the we started seeing the president there calling global is fake news. So there is some learning. There is some cross country learning and importing of tactics to attack the mainstream media and those now now attacking social media companies. Uh, WhatsApp complicates that, like Sophia was saying, it's much easier to remove speech from Twitter and Facebook than it is when it's speech between two people on WhatsApp, right? I got this message and I'm sending my family that message. But I think there's a lot of similarities. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it doesn't fit, right? Because when you import an argument into a new context, it doesn't really fit nicely. Um, but definitely, this idea that the social media Silicon Valley is a liberal uh, organization that's censoring conservative speech is present in Brazil, I think as well. It looks like we are out of questions. So I'll just ask uh, our, our speakers if there's anybody who wants to put in the last word. I'd just, like oh, I'd just like to uh, thank you again and saying that it was a pleasure be with you, uh, be, uh, with you tonight. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to uh, have a conversation with you. So thanks very much for all of our speakers, uh, the commentators tonight, and for those of you who tuned in and uh, shared your questions with them. Um, and I wish you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you.